So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the world. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and welcome to the last of season one of our FIP Insider webinars. Over the past seven weeks, we've run nine webinars and had well over a thousand attendees with many more joining us today. And thank you once again for your support. All of those, those of you who've been watching these webinars, I know there are many repeat viewers. We're taking a small break next week and then season two of these webinars will begin on June the 4th with an interview with the MD of The Big Issue. We'll be looking at how they've had to make a rapid transition to a completely new publishing model in the face of the coronavirus crisis. It's an important topic for a brand that makes a real difference to people's lives and I hope that you'll be able to join us. We spent a few weeks looking uh, recently at different monetization options, but this week we're going to get a holistic display to the market and of what comes next uh, from a major media company. Dow Jones was originally founded in 1882 and launched its flagship publication, the Wall Street Journal, seven years later in 1889. Owned by News Corp since 2007, these 130-year-old brands are thriving in the digital age, and you can see that from News Corp's most recent quarterly results where they highlighted the success of the Dow Jones business, reporting large growth in digital only subscribers while experiencing record traffic across their digital properties. Our guests today joining us from London and Hong Kong are three senior executives from Dow Jones and we'll be asking them to tell us more about their recent successes, the impact of the crisis and what they think the future holds both for their brands and for the industry at large. But before I introduce them, let me run through some very quick housekeeping items, particularly for those of you who've not joined us before. Today's session is partly a presentation and partly a Q&A, and we're very keen to hear from as many of you as possible. If you look in your webinar controls at the bottom of your screen, you'll find the Q&A button. Go in there and you can submit your questions and also upvote other delegates' questions and make comments on them if you've got something relevant to add. There is also a chat box which you can access via your webinar controls. You can use this to chat either privately with myself and the speakers or with the other attendees and we'll be keeping an eye on that throughout the event. I recommend that you keep it open because the FIP team and the Dow Jones team will be posting comments and useful links throughout the event. Now these events and the work that FIP does to share knowledge across the industry would not be possible without the support of our corporate partners. Press Reader are now one of the world's largest digital content distribution businesses and have been significant supporters of FIP and of the industry more widely for many years. UPM is the world's leading biofour company, constantly innovating in the field of forestry products. Many of our magazine members literally wouldn't exist without them. We'd like to thank both of them for, for their support and we would not be able to produce this valuable insight without them. I'd also like to thank FIPS members for the support that you give to the organization and a reminder that in July, we will be putting most of our content behind a members only wall on our website. So for those of you that are not members, if you want to continue making use of the knowledge and insight that we provide, we would encourage you to join. Membership starts from as little as 50 pounds per month. Please contact me on james at fip.com for more details on how to do that. Before we start, also just a word about FIP's current position. We rely on the support of the industry to enable us to carry out our work. Our two leading annual conferences, the Digital Innovators Summit and the FIP World Media Congress provide the bulk of FIP's revenue. And there's no certainty to what extent we can count on income from these events in the immediate term, certainly in the physical space. To continue our work on behalf of the industry, such as this new FIP Insider webinar series, we've decided to create a GoFundMe page an initiative allowing you to contribute to support our work for the industry as you see fit. The link should be appearing now in the chat box and if you're able to make a donation, that would go a long way towards covering the cost of these webinars and allow us to continue to bring the knowledge and networking that you need to continue to grow your business. And a reminder that of course, as a not-for-profit, we don't pay dividends, all income, including these donations, is invested back into activities of benefit to the industry as a whole. Mm. Tomorrow you'll all get a post-event email with a link to the slides and details of our forthcoming webinars, including links to sign up for those. We've also just announced today the launch of the FIP Congress for 2020. This will take place in September and instead of being a physical event, will consist of a month of webinars, roundtables and network sessions as we take the Congress virtual for the first time. 
There'll be more details appearing in the chat shortly, and if you're finding these sessions useful, then you definitely won't want to miss the Congress. Details of all this are on the website, fit.com, and in the post-event emails, and we look forward to seeing you there. Right, that's enough from me. Let me introduce today's guests. My first guest today is Jonathan Wright, Global Managing Director for Dow Jones, also a FIP Board Director, so I have to be nice to him because he's one of my bosses. And we're also joined by Nick Pym, VP of Commercial Partnerships for EMEA, and Joe Martin, who does the same for APAC. Welcome, gentlemen. Well, thanks for having us. Uh, can you hear me all right? I, 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 my internet seemed to go down during your introduction, so hopefully I'm, uh, I'm back. I think everybody's. I think everybody's got you okay. Inundated with chat comments. If that has not is not the case, so um, let me start with you, Johnny, and just to ask you, uh, really, to 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 ask the obvious question to you, which is, how has Dow Jones been coping in the present crisis? Well, uh, as I say, thanks for having us. Lovely to see you, uh, James. I should uh, I should explain, as you said, I am in Hong Kong. If my hand comes into the camera shot and you see that I'm electronically tagged, I should uh, explain I arrived back in Hong Kong from uh, the US seven days ago, and Hong Kong has a 14-day home quarantine and electronic uh, tagging system in place, which seems to be working very well. So uh, that is why I have the, uh, the jewellery on my wrist. Um, you know, it's been similar for FIP, and I imagine a number of uh, FIP uh, members, some of whom I've been speaking to during this uh, this period, uh, it's been a challenging time. Uh, now, obviously, there are some um, some opportunities that come out of challenges. That's a that's a cliche, but I think uh, cliche for a reason. Uh, I think there are a, a number of uh, uh, areas, and we can touch on some of them where we've looked to to respond, and some some things that have worked really really quite well. Um, in terms of how Dow Jones is doing, I, I guess I'd categorize it in three areas. One is around our staff and our way of working. Uh, the other is around our products and, and changes and, and reinvestments and enhancements that have been made. Uh, and then, of course, our customers, whether they be uh, advertising, subscribers, uh, or uh, uh, customers of our professional information business. I should just sort of caveat and precede the conversation. I'm sure everyone's familiar with Dow Jones, but as well as having the Wall Street Journal, Barron's and Market Watch, uh, we also have a very robust professional information business with the likes of Factiva and Dow Jones Risk and Compliance. So um, uh, a, a number of varied revenue streams, and I'm sure we can touch on how they've uh, been impacted later, or I can answer any questions on that as well. Um, so in, in those three areas, we were very lucky at the beginning, uh, our executive committee, very strong leadership who, you know, identified some of those key priorities that actually help navigate a, a, a crisis. And a, I think I read something earlier saying once every two generation, uh, in terms of the level of, of this, uh, this challenge that we're facing, mm -hmm. uh, I think that putting our staff uh, and our uh, employees first, their health, safety, and well-being uh, was, was crucial. But also our mission, you know, the importance of quality, trusted news, data, and analysis. I think once you are able to define uh, your priorities, it's a lot easier to navigate and, and sort of harness the, uh, what is uh, almost 5,000 employees in, in over 50 countries. Um, so yeah, so far um, it's been a challenge, and uh, but but I feel uh, confident that the, the company as a whole has really sort of pulled together and prioritised what our mission is and, and and what we're looking to achieve, and I'm hopeful that we'll come out of this uh, uh, stronger than we went into it. Just uh, talking about the the first thing you mentioned there, the ways of working and the and the the kind of switch from office to home environment. How has that gone? Yeah, I, I, it's it's interesting one. I mean, we uh, the first offices that we had to to close were in mainland China and Hong Kong. And I remember talking to our, our CEO at the time. Uh, this Monday, uh, we had our new CEO Almar Latour uh, take over the reins, a 25 year uh, Dow Jones veteran, and we're very excited uh, about this new chapter. But when this started, Will Lewis was was still the CEO, and I can remember talking to him about. Um, as we close those offices that we were going to have this great experiment uh, of, of working from home and, and how, how it will work. So as mm. 
with many uh, FIT members, the, the process and the um, ability to publish fairly complex products, analysis uh, across the risk and compliance, PIP business, the newspapers, uh, magazines uh, and uh, podcasts and, and, and all the other platforms that we, we publish news and information on. It's been, it's been an incredibly uh, interesting and steep learning curve. Uh, and I think it's one that uh, the teams uh, have really stepped up to. I think that our, our products and our ability to get um, those to our customers uh, has, has gone without a blip. And in fact, there's been enhancements and developments along the way. So it's not just you know, the, the bare basics of getting it working. It's actually uh, thinking smartly, putting customers uh, at the center of how we think about what we do. And, you know, it's been an, an interesting experiment, one that's been going since January in, in, in Asia and obviously more recently across uh, Europe and the rest of the US. Um, but, but so far, so good. It comes with, uh, you know, a number of, of uh, things that one must keep an eye on as the health and safety of, of staff being paramount. But it's, uh, it's been so far so good. And that's testament to so many departments as other companies uh, dialed in will we'll, we'll recognize, you know, whether it's our, our HR teams, our technology teams, our um, security teams, our, our real estate teams. I mean, you really need to uh, garner this sort of huge uh, base of expertise to make this run, uh, run smoothly. And, and so far it has, and that must be a testament to the contingency planning. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a, it's a very familiar story, the rapid move to working from home. I mean, not quite on the scale that Dow Jones has done. Obviously, now people are starting to think about the future and what the world might look like after lockdown. You're based in Asia, where the lockdown ended a little while ago. Uh, what's the world of work going to look like as we come out of this? Is this uh, something that's going to continue, this working from home trend? It's, uh, I guess it's the question, are we all going to be on a beach in Tahiti or are we going back to the offices, right? I mean, I think it's, uh, I think for Dow Jones, from my own personal perspective and opinion, it would be a shame almost if things just went back to normal. I think we've actually got some great learnings. We've, we've uh, in some instances, some of our sort of processes and approaches are actually improved. Um, so, so I think we're going uh, we're gonna to take some really interesting uh, lessons from this and, and apply them to our, our future way of working. Um, uh, and I think, again, that's, that is testament to our employees. You know, they have uh, embraced this challenge and, and uh, worked so incredibly diligently, not only supporting themselves and, and each other, but, but the business as a whole. So, yeah, I, I think there'll be some sort of uh, um, possibly hybrid approach, uh, you know, is an office somewhere where you go to collaborate rather than sit at a computer every day. Um, I think, I think we'll, we're, we're working through that at the moment and, and I'm very excited to see. In terms of for other businesses, whether they be publishing or broader, you know, it speaks to some of the content that we create. You can see there on the slide, the, the making it work section, uh, which was uh, one of these um, you know, new, new sections and product enhancements we did. Our job uh, is to help people make decisions. I think the great thing about the journal in this instance is it, it it's not just about the financial impact or economic or markets or, uh, or business. Uh, there is coverage that allows people to make informed decisions with trusted news and analysis uh, on their personal life, family life, business, um, and to help them make sort of informed decisions. So that very question you ask, we, we've tried to, to compile various views and analysis to, to, to help inform that decision, um, uh, which I encourage people to have a look at. Well, I think, so, and I think uh, somebody from the, the Dow Jones comms team is going to post a link to those articles and resources in the chat later on. So that would be a, okay. a good one for delegates to look at because I had a look earlier. There's a, a whole ton of resources in there about how the world of work is changing, which is obviously very, very relevant for, for right now. Let's, let's go on to the changes in the behavior of consumers, uh, the consumers of Dow Jones and Wall Street Journal products um, in the last few months. Obviously, we've seen over the last few weeks uh, lots of evidence emerging about what's happening. We did two sessions recently on digital subscriptions where media owners are reporting record increases in subscriptions and traffic. Uh, News Corp alluded to that as well in their last quarterly earnings result. Is it something you've experienced in your brands? 
Yes, we have. Uh, and I think, you know, I remember I was uh, reminiscing with someone earlier today about the fantastic Fit World Congress in uh, Las Vegas, where I was uh, lucky enough to, to speak about diversifying revenue streams. And I think that, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting conundrum that publishers have faced and will we'll no doubt go on to talk about advertising. But one thing that we've all seen, I think, particularly the professional news outlets is, is an increase in traffic and I think it's that that desire uh, to find trusted uh, news. Um, you mentioned the quarterly earnings report, our Q3 earnings that Robert Thompson, uh, our CEO at News Corp, uh, held with Susan Panuccio, our CFO. Uh, some of the numbers which I have here, because I don't want to obviously misquote them, but our subscriptions across the group were up 10% to 3.6 million. Uh, and for just in terms of traffic numbers, Wall Street Journal up 74%. Uh, in terms of uniques, 165% uh, uh, up at Barron's and a threefold increase in Market Watch uh, as well. So we've absolutely seen a, a flight to quality news, uh, and it's a trend that we were seeing before uh, the uh, COVID pandemic, but it's absolutely been uh, accelerated during during this time. And uh, let's then look at the specifics around your brand. So you're looking at uh, new records in terms of the number of subscriptions that you've got, large increases and so on. What's kind of underlying that, do you think? I mean, is it something to do with trust? I think so. I mean, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm sure it is. I think that there is a, a lot of information out there and there's a lot of uh, sources. But I mean, now more than ever, you need accurate information, you need balanced, sourced, ethically generated uh, content. Um, and I think some of those big brands, uh, and there are of course new entries into the market who also approach news like that, so established and, and new, but from putting journalism uh, at the heart of what they do with the integrity, data and analysis as well, across our pit businesses, so I think that the Wall Street Journal, you, you mentioned at the beginning, the sort of the history, uh, how long uh, the journal's been around and the Dow Jones brand. I think that people are definitely more discerning uh, about where they're getting their news from. I think the, as we had on the slide there, Edelman conducted during the, the middle of this uh, uh, pandemic, the uh, one of their trust barometers showing an increase uh, in trust in, in in news media um, uh, and, and, you know, concern about um, the source that people are getting their news from. So I think that absolutely has to be, has to be part of it. That then coupled with we and others have, have looked at how do we cover this particular uh, story and, and how do we make that content available has also played a, played a part in it. Yeah, I wanted to, to ask you about that because we have covered in quite a few of these sessions how different media businesses are approaching coronavirus or COVID-related uh, content. They've been creating dedicated products or, or content blocks. Can you just tell us a little bit about what you guys have been doing in that regard? Yeah, I think I think from the product standpoint, I mean, the, the sort of the first uh, and obvious thing is we've had a, a banner at the top of the uh, the site wsj.com and we've, we've actually made the decision to make our uh, coronavirus uh, coverage free. Uh, I think that's a, not a decision that all publishers have, have made. I think the reason we made it, uh, we've, I've been with the Wall Street Journal for 10 years now and it, it is definitely true to say that, that uh, discovery of our content is a great driver. There are depending, and I've worked in different parts of the world, depending where you are in the world, there's different perceptions of our brand, of our coverage, as there is of other brands and, and coverage. And the, the best thing uh, to get over the hurdle of experiencing journalists to surface that content. So we've actually seen a whole new cohort of people come because of the coronavirus uh, coverage, the fact that we've made it free. We've seen that convert into subscribers. Um, as well, obviously our job is then to, to keep them engaged and, and keep them experiencing our uh, content. Um, but to answer your question specifically around uh, that coverage, that's what we've done. We've also, you know, I was talking to Drew Dow, who's our editor in Asia just uh, earlier today. There's been a huge um, uh, re, uh, reassignment of, of some of our resources. Obviously, we've bolstered our, our health coverage is a great example. Um, 
So we've looked at our coverage and how our newsroom operates, how it, how it joins up and communicates uh, for, for, for the coverage that we want to do around the world 24-7. Uh, but we've also repurposed tools as well as resources. So for example, uh, the product and news team are working on some, some, some really good uh, tools for the upcoming US election, which I'm sure we're all very excited about. Uh, and we've repurposed some of those tools, brought them forward, Q&A tools, for example, which are now running on the site, which were originally uh, earmarked for that. Um, we've obviously identified, we have a huge print readership in, in the US, potential uh, disruptions to that. And as you can see on the slide, the today's print edition has been a very popular uh, email edition uh, that we've, uh, we've given to our um, subscribers. Um, healthcare coverage, as I said, um, and has been expanded and we've repurposed some of our um, products, including the um, journal, uh, the health and the CMO newsletters to give daily uh, coverage. So, you know, a number of product enhancements strategically uh, ensuring not only because we think ethically it, it's important for people to be able to get the coverage, making it free. Uh, so some strategic as well as resource and product uh, developments, I guess, during the now last uh, eight to 10 weeks. And you've, and you've made, you've followed the lead of many other businesses. You've made your coronavirus content free. Is that right? Yeah, I don't know if we, we followed their lead or they followed ours. It's a chicken <laughs> and the egg, right? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think there's a, for us, uh, we believe that professional journalism is a cornerstone of democracy. We think journalism plays a very important part in society. And I think that uh, that would have absolutely fed into Matt Murray, our editor in chief's decision to make that uh, coverage free and front and center. Um, and, you know, it's something that, that I'm pleased uh, that we've done. And it has also led obviously to more uh, discovery of our content and us to engage with with whole whole new audiences which is very exciting i mean that's the what joe nick and i do a lot of the time is outside of the us where we're based is is how do we help bring the journal content to as many people as pos possible whether that's partnering with other publishers whether mm. uh, other uh, institutions um and this is definitely part of that i think that this content being free is a, is a great addition to that Yes, and if uh, at, attendees, if you look, or, or people watching, if you look in the chat box, you'll see that uh, the Dow Jones colleague Toby uh, Doman has pu published links to the free content in there that you can you can have a look at the COVID content and also the the home working content as well. So the links are there, and you can go and test that out for yourselves. We have got a couple of questions that have come in from John Wilpers and from uh, Joachim uh, Wiedemann. Thank you very much for both of those. We're going to cover some of what you're talking about in those questions later on. So I will, if that's okay with you, come back to those. A little bit later but I want first of all to just carry on looking at the impact on, on Dow Jones's business we've talked about content that's uh, uh, and delivery of content that is changing we've talked about digital subscriptions you guys Dow Jones and Wall Street Journal had a very big events business pre-crisis now this is something that's on everybody's mind uh, as one of the critical areas to diversify revenue pre-crisis it had been top of most people's agendas it had been undergoing dramatic growth Presumably, that's all disappeared now, has it? No, I wouldn't characterise it uh, like that. I, uh, Lee Gilmore is our, our head of events and live journalism, and I think the way that uh, she would characterise it is that ultimately our live journalism strategy, which isn't either physical events or virtual events, if you like, it's about live journalism. It's about bringing our journalism to life. It's about convening audiences it's about creating conversations and communities that hasn't changed in fact in many instances it's more important now than ever um you know similar to to, to fit uh, and and other publishers uh, watching this uh we're all bound by various travel uh, and gathering restrictions so we we have certainly looked at what is the digital solution uh, in the short term, I think very, very early on, uh, our health forum, as you can see there, became uh, digital uh, and um, was was incredibly well attended. And, and, you know, some of these events are having many, many thousands of, uh, of people participate. I think it's an interesting time where we are looking. We have so many different types of events across our different brands, the CEO council being 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 
you know, the pinnacle, if you like, of a, of a membership triangle, the CEOs of, of some of the largest companies in the world uh, with, with an annual membership. They have an annual meeting in Washington, but other events around the world uh, through to um, all variety of, of, of events, WSA Plus, membership events, etc. So at the moment, we're definitely the team, and it's a great global events team uh, in Asia, Europe, and in the US, are working through and testing different solutions. Um, I think the exciting thing is they were doing that before this anyway, uh, and we are going to come out of this so with such a strong proposition. I don't think the digital element will, will ever disappear. I think that even when we are able to confine uh, people, whether it's at our technology events in Laguna Beach or CEO Council in Washington or London or, or Journal House in Singapore or Can Lions, wherever it may be, I think there'll always be some, some really enhanced digital capabilities that have come out of this. Um, but, you know, the events business is, is absolutely core to us as it is to other publishers and uh, it continues apace uh, and... Um, you know, we're, we're excited to see where, where it goes. Um, and the feedback we've had so far from, from our subscribers, from our members, from our event attendees, as well as from our sponsors, importantly, uh, is, has been very positive. Uh, uh, you mentioned it there, acceleration almost, or a continuation of work that have been going on already to develop a virtual uh, events business. Brings me very neatly to a question from Richard Bean. Thank you, Richard, for watching. Who's asking, are there any initiatives that you've taken because of COVID-19 that you wish you'd taken before? I mean, I guess it would have been from a, from a contingency plan point of view, we did before we had to close offices do a, do a, a big piece of work around the resources, technology and support we'd need to have all our staff work remotely. Uh, and I think we did that just in time. I think in hindsight, would you, you contingency planning was absolutely fantastic. The, the infectious disease management task force that came together was excellent. If you had a crystal ball, would you do some things earlier in terms of, of that then possibly? Uh, but I think that, that the teams did a, an amazing job uh, uh, on the whole. Uh, and I think, you know, some of the, it's interesting because in some senses it's not rocket science. Our job is to get news, information, and facts out to people. We are always uh, innovating, testing, and trying new things. And um, uh, I, I can't think of a specific thing that I wish we'd had better set up because everything's always constantly changing anyway. We're always yeah. just to news cycles, to audience, to technology developments, to um, to various things. So, so I think we we were re we were genuinely well uh, positioned, and our leadership responded, and our employees all responded uh, in in such a fantastic way that you know, of course, there are things out of our control um, that that um, you know impact things, which were as was said on the quarterly report. We're we're cautious as we look forward to Q4 and beyond about exactly what's going to happen in the market, what's going to happen with, uh, with some of the advertising uh, appetite, uh, et cetera. But no, I, th I think that uh, I think we're, we're generally not complacent for sure, but, but certainly happy with um, the, the things that we had in place as, as this crisis hit. In other words, you've got a culture of change there already. So this is just this is dramatic change, but it's not something that's scary. Uh, it's a little scary, I'll be honest. <laughs> the scary elements of it, right? I mean, certainly. But yeah, I think, I think that would be a way to say it far briefer and more concise than I did. Let, um, let's look, look at advertising, an area you know very, very well. Um, we've been hearing feedback from other publishers of declines of anything from 50 to 70% in their advertising revenue. Has that been your experience too? And, and what are you doing about that? Well, I, I should definitely, I mean, I do know a bit about advertising. I've spent 20 years in, working for publications and uh, about 15 of them directly uh, in, in advertising. Um, but I would plug Josh Stinchcombe, who is our chief revenue officer, who, who does run our global uh, media uh, and ad sales team, who is, in my experience, the best in the business and 
would give you incredible insights, uh, which which may be very welcome uh, for uh, the members of, of FIT. Um, but you know, advertising historically uh, for us and for, for you know, we talk about it all the time in these sort of formats and in congresses. It's an incredibly important revenue stream for us. We have three, which is why we talk about diverse revenue streams. Advertising and sponsorship, absolutely a crucial one. Membership and subscriptions, and then our professional information business. Um, so it's, it's, it's very important. Has, it, uh, has that landscape changed over the last several years? Of course it has, and we've all experienced that. Um, I would point to that quarterly earnings report the other week where digital advertising was up uh, 25%, uh, percent, uh, mm. Robert Thompson talked about. So it's interesting, Josh and his team, again, we talk about different responses to the current situation. Uh, and I'll talk about a couple of them very briefly. The Trust, which is our in-house agency, a lot of their work, which is sort of helping brands tell their story, uh, was with video, for example. And suddenly not being able to go out, shoot video on location, how they pivoted more to animation and solutions around uh, uh, solutions that could be done from, from home, as it were, uh, was pretty incredible. Um, also, the advertising team, the print advertising team, uh, put in place a, um, uh, a solution of, or, or a guarantee around uh, recall rates for print ads in the US, guaranteeing levels of uh, rates. So the ad team as much as any other team are on the ground listening to their, their customers and, and certainly trying to, to help navigate the situation. The bottom line is, as we've just talked about, our audience is growing, our paid audience is growing. Um, the journal already has obviously a huge share of voice of senior decision makers uh, globally. Uh, as this slide says uh, on the Kantar Reader, a recent barometer, only 8% of consumers think that brands should stop advertising. So there is a huge engaged audience that, that brands are looking to reach and tell their story to. And of course, as you can see, some examples of advertisers doing that in the, in the, in the current climate. So I think it's beholden on us to, to help them do that, to tell those stories, to provide this trusted platform uh, to uh, engage with our, with our audience, whether that be through the events or through the uh, advertising, through digital or, or print opportunities. Um, so advertising will continue to evolve. Uh, but I think, again, under Josh's leadership, we've, uh, we, we are not complacent about the future. We do not have a crystal ball about exactly what's going to happen. Uh, but as things you heard about in our Q3 earnings report, uh, we feel we're, we're in a, a good position at the moment. That does uh, lead me quite neatly onto a question from John Wilpers. John, who is the author of our innovation uh, report annually. He's, and this is something that's come up in almost every single session we've run so far. It'd be interesting to get your view on whether you think the mix of revenue in the long term is going to change. Uh, clearly, everybody's still going to have advertising, still going to have digital subscriptions, <laughs> and hopefully things like events and so on will come back. In force, but do you think that this crisis is going to lead to some kind of permanent shift in the tectonics of those revenue streams to make one more prominent than the others, the direct to consumer element perhaps? I, I think, you know, I can speak to my personal experience and the experience we've had at Dow Jones. We've, you know, there was a, a shift that happened in the financial crisis for us, certainly in, in 09 and an impact to, to advertising. And I think, um, you know, I've certainly seen coverage that would suggest there's uh, uh, an impact uh, taking place now. Um, but we have, we have seen and we've publicly talked about a shift uh, in our revenue streams to digital, obviously, uh, and then to membership. Um, so we've personally experienced a, a shift in those. It doesn't prioritize one over the other. I mean, they're both incredibly important revenue streams. They're both areas that we continue as a company to invest in and develop. But um, I think the answer to the question uh, more broadly is it depends what publishers do, right? We, Joe, Nick, and I have had a great five years with the commercial partnerships team, as we call it at Dow Jones, speaking to publishers around the world. I think we have some 50 odd partnerships of, of, of varying types at the moment. And I think the, the boys will maybe touch on some of them um, shortly. 
but the conversation we have a lot is is around our experience of diversified revenue streams our experience of dynamic paywalls uh and engagement and churn numbers and 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 uh, our experience around advertising. And it's interesting when we were first going to India and Japan, having those conversations, the notion of, of, of paid for digital content was, we were laughed out of the room. And mm. now you see uh, huge publishers uh, across India and, and Japan, as two examples, uh, I think this is a trend obviously globally, looking at how do they diversify those revenue streams. Uh, are, as you know, as everybody probably knows, it takes time and it takes investment to build a subscription business. Mm. You, cannot, you cannot replace one revenue stream with another overnight. And indeed, you don't actually want to replace one with the other. You want to diversify. You want to have multiple revenue streams that protect you against various market dynamics. So to answer uh, our viewer's question, I think it's that opportunity is there to diversify the mix. It's mm. down to publishers to make the decision to commit to that long-term um, and, uh, and realize the value uh, of the content that they're producing and ultimately look at ways of, of being paid for that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's reinforced by the data that we've gathered on just to pick digital subscriptions as an area. The long-term commitment aspect you can see in the numbers over the couple of years we've been running this that it is a long-term game but the, the growth rates are definitely there but also that it is a global phenomenon you're right and we're now seeing large numbers coming out of markets like China and Japan and India that, that weren't there before so that's that's really interesting you, you touched on uh, partnerships there and I think it's a good opportunity to bring in our, our other guests Nick and and Joe let's, let's start with you Nick um, for many years I know that Wall Street Journal and Dow Jones have been using partnerships as a way to drive growth back to the core brand. Can you just tell us a little bit more about how that works? And, we, and Joachim, one of, our, one of our attendees has asked a similar question around um, developing new global news alliances. Can you just tell us a little bit about how that partnerships business works? Sure, James, thanks. Um, yeah, so we, we wanted to touch on, on what, what we've been doing in, in the kind of partnerships team for the last few years, and then obviously what's, what's happened uh, recently. So, just to reflect um, on that fact that, that we've, you know, the last five years um, successfully driven growth um, in, through partnerships in new markets outside the US. And as background, Johnny talked about some of our other products at Dow Jones. We're very fortunate to have multiple brands across um, our consumer and professional businesses and essentially three main uh, revenue streams in, uh, in advertising, membership and professional information. So, We've spent many, many years trying to grow individual subscriptions outside the US with, with some success, um, but it's obviously it's very complicated and, and expensive to market direct to, to the end uh, reader in I don't know, 170 odd countries uh, around the world. So we also knew from some uh, research that we'd done based on some pre and post trial surveys was that at the Wall Street Journal, we had a, a perception problem. And what I mean by that is that one of the barriers to uptake by new readers outside the US was that perception that probably in the name that we were very American, right wing, and not very international. Whereas that same piece of research told us that once people had sampled our content, it dramatically changed those perceptions and increased uh, uptake. Mm -hmm. So as Johnny said earlier, we knew we needed a better way to get our content out to as many people as possible. So. Uh, uh, it, it was almost exactly five years ago we, we, we decided to, um, to pursue the opportunity to create mutually beneficial partnerships to accelerate growth for Dow Jones brands in new markets outside the US, uh, but with a particular focus on our membership brands. Um, because when we thought about the needs of other brands, especially major publishers um, and leading titles, but also brands outside of publishing that rely on deepening engagement and a direct customer relationship, um, we decided to align our partnership model with this move, which, as I said, is especially apparent in our industry to establish and grow sustainable subscription models. Mm. Um, so currently we have, again, as Johnny said, around 50 partners across the globe who are successfully using our uh, premium content, our memberships, um, our brands and our knowledge in different ways. Um, 
I think uh, to, 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 to publishers listening to, to what we've done, um, I, I'd say at this point that our approach to partnerships is, is certainly not that kind of one size fits all. We've worked with lots of different partners in lots of different ways, be that to enhance the kind of the editorial proposition, uh, to support subscription acquisition initiatives, churn reduction, um, and we've increasingly started. Sorry, uh, we've uh, increasingly started to work with partners uh, to create new revenue streams by franchising some of our brands in in their market. So. The last thing I'll say is while it's worked for us in this way and it's worked well over the last five years um, and a mutually beneficial partnership obviously is a great way to combine resources to drive growth. Um, what I'd say is I think it's important to be really clear um, as we are about what we can bring to a partnership and how our partners can benefit from that but also that we're clear about what we need from a partnership and what we don't have. So for our so case for the last five time. years Sorry to interrupt, this is quite different then from the old traditional relationship where you would have the, the licensor that sat uh, in heaven almost uh, doling out content to its partners at its, at its own whim. This sounds a lot more, a lot more like a much, a much more of a two-way relationship between you and the partners, is that right? Uh, absolutely, and I think, um, you know, again, from talking to thousands of publishers around the world over the last five years, you know, we've established that to really, um, you know, no, no two partnerships are the same. And that, that's, that's entirely true. You know, to really understand what both partners want out of the, out of the partnership um, and to look at kind of aligning around mutual goals. And frankly, you know, as I explained for us, um, we're very clear that we want to um, uh, expand our subscriptions business and, and, and some of our other premium brands within Dow Jones. We're also very clear about how partners can align with, with that and benefit from the value of our content, which, you know, which has never been uh, more in demand. And uh, Joe, if I can turn to you, um, perhaps to, ask, to answer this question, what have changes have you seen in the international network over the past few months? And, and what, are the, what are you guys kind of doing to ensure that those partnerships are robust? Yeah, well, um, I think is uh, is Nick explained that the majority of our, our, our partnerships are with other publishers, and I mean they're largely faced with with similar challenges that we're all familiar with on on, on this call. In that um, we've seen declines in in advertising, but at the same time, are uh, seeing kind of record traffic and uh, engagement numbers with their uh, with, with their audiences. So it, you know, it's fair to say that those that are more advanced and better set up for for reader generated revenue have been faring better than, than those that are kind of wholly reliant on, uh, on advertising. But, but so yes, yeah, so, I mean, those kind of three areas that, that Nick uh, referred to as the different types of partnerships where we obviously uh, license content, have kind of subscription bundling, and then our, our franchise deals. But they're, they're really all to, um, for us about obviously reaching a new audience. Uh, but for our partners, we, we measure those on kind of three main metrics of, uh, of of acquisition, uh, engagement, and, and retention. Uh, I mean, just to kind of give you an idea how that's been uh, been playing out, we, we can't share uh, kind of stats with all of our, our partners, but if we look into um, some of our partners in in News Corp, um, the the Times of London is uh, is seen a um, uh, a twenty percent improvement in its churn for all of the their subscribers that have been given Wall Street Journal subscriptions as well. Uh, and then with the Australian in, in Australia, they've seen a 25% uh, improvement in, in churn as well, uh, just by giving that, that, that bundle. So they're obviously kind of meaningful, meaningful numbers. And then on the, uh, on the acquisition side is, um, is listed here, uh, one of our, our partners in, in Japan that's been, uh, and have kind of been more uh, aggressive in a, in a paywall strategy in, in what is, Traditionally, uh, kind of quite a, a print-centric market is, uh, has seen a, an eighteen percent increase in its overall number of, um, uh, of subscribers just in, in that period since since January, and then a, a fifty percent increase in, in their uptake of, um, uh, of Wall Street Journal subscriptions. So, so they're obviously the, their audience that are in, in search of uh, you know, objective news and, and, and journalism as well, and, and trying to get a kind of a more kind of global uh, global outlook. Uh, and then, you know, and then one thing that we've been doing a lot more is, you know, is, is both Johnny and, and Nick have uh, mentioned is that um, kind of the, the, the kind of true uh, partnership aspects of some focusing on some of the more 
technical aspects as well as just giving the, the assets of, of content and brand and, and, and subs, but really focusing on some of the kind of knowledge sharing elements uh, as well. So, you know, for example, bringing in uh, one of our experts in, in the US to do kind of a, a, kind of a knowledge share or masterclass on, on uh, our payment methodology, uh, exactly how, uh, how that works, or our optimization team that can give suggestions on the kind of A-B tests that they've been running and that they, they can recommend to our partners to help with things like the buying experience for our, for, for our partners readers as well, that all, you know, obviously will have, um, uh, should have kind of a, a positive uh, outcome when, when implemented. Um, so, you know, I, I think overall that there's, um, it, it's been you know, challenging times for, for, for us and uh, our, our publishers as well, but there's also quite a bit uh, to be optimistic about. And, and that shift that, um, that, that Johnny mentioned is, I think we've seen, it's just been kind of accelerated in this time that, that you know, those who've had a kind of a head start in, in really looking to, to build a subscription business uh, um, uh, are doing better, but, but those that are moving towards that, it's just been accelerating at the moment. Um, so you know, I, I think that, you know, part of the reason that we set up this um, uh, this team was uh, you know, for us to work closer with, with publishers. But it's, I think it's been clear to us that there's never been a, a, a more important time for that, in, uh, in particularly in this uh, this challenging time. This is quite a different model then from the traditional model, where you know you you get a check from a licensee every quarter or whatever it is. There's there's a real kind of incentivization process here, is there, for them to drive subscriptions to Wall Street Journal or Dow Jones overall? Is that how it works? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, you know, right, yeah, rather than it just being a, a kind of a, a transactional relationship, uh, it, you know, once the, the, the partnership's set up and the, the goals are aligned and, uh, and you know, their success is, is, is effectively ours as well, it, you know, it incentivizes us to, to try and give some of the, the more kind of knowledge and, and insight and some of the learnings that we've had that, um, that can help them then grow because it's, you know, it's it, it by definition has been, been mutually beneficial. So, uh, so that's been you know, very kind of core to our, uh, you know, our partnership strategy is, is, is trying to uh, share some of our, our learnings and insight as well. And us obviously to, to learn from our partners, which we have done. Uh, so if I could just add yeah, something, I, I think, I think as Joe rightly says, I think, any partnership has to be mutually beneficial. I, th I think that there is, uh, if you look at our, the majority of our, our partnerships, I think they've grown organically together. So that's how we tend to structure them. Our, our success, our partner success is our success and, and we grow together. But the, the point I wanted to make, and this is also a shout out to, to FIP and the role of FIP, I know that members and non-members will be on this, there is, it is so crucial for the publishing industry uh, to uh, collaborate and to, uh, and to uh, share to the extent that they can their learnings, their fears, their findings. And that's why FIP is a great uh, group that, that advocates for that. But also we as members of FIP, these partnerships, a lot of these conversations and conversations we still have um, don't necessarily uh, although obviously our end goal is to have a commercial relationship that is mutually beneficial, but we are happy to talk and share uh, this knowledge share that Joe speaks of. Uh, our group not only has salespeople in it, but it has relationship managers, uh, uh, operations and delivery experts uh, who are um, very much up to speed on all of our best practice uh, and available across Asia and Europe. Uh, Caroline Postel is not on this call is is the third VP in this group who runs that and you know all I would say is and as we've said at, at a number of FIP events we we're happy to talk and, and share we do think that uh, publishing uh, survives together there's going to be no last person standing it's about uh, how we collaborate share and, and, and work together so we we certainly are we hope uh, approachable uh, for that those sort of conversations yeah well, half, obviously we heartily endorse that and, and uh, we, we rely very much on the industry collaborating to enable us to produce a lot of the knowledge and insight that we do um, I've got a question from Mike Green here which uh, Johnny maybe you can take which is about your experience of pricing both for subscriptions and events during the pandemic appreciate that you may not uh, be as across the events business but on subscriptions have you seen any change in in pricing as a result of the pandemic 
we, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's our de rigueur phrase to call it a dynamic paywall, but it's a dynamic paywall. And we, um, we certainly have constantly uh, test uh, pricing uh, and packs as well. You know, the, uh, the concept of less for less or more for more, uh, international pricing, different markets and things like that. So um, our intro prices, our conversion rates, et cetera. I mean, it is, it is an absolute science. And what's interesting and, and important, because I know that some publishers, again, you know, I'm not looking to certainly tell people what's right or wrong i'm just giving our experience but i i know that some newsrooms and publishing organizations that i've delivered uh sorry that i've, I've visited still uh retain that decision of what's paid what's not uh in different departments sometimes in, in a newsroom whereas when you take that sort of data-led approach you have a dynamic approach to it it allows you to test lots of different things so um we've seen um I don't want to speak incorrectly, but I don't think we've changed our intro rate during the pandemic. Uh, and so uh, from a pricing standpoint, uh, there, there's been no change, but I think what we will, and that uh, growth team and optimization team will see is, is different levels of, of engagement and, uh, and conversion rates post, uh, post this, uh, those intro levels and post this situation. So that's the point about that I was making earlier about the exposure to our content uh, and then people getting an understanding of what the journal means, whole new cohorts and audience. But they're, they're, um, that's the, the best I can give you in terms of uh, pricing around that. Um, just uh, we're running out of time just before we get to the kind of final question one other thing I wanted to ask you about and if, if anybody does have any extra questions now's the time to ask them but before we come to those um, this going back to the very beginning in this question of working from home there's been a lot of focus on the need to ensure that people's mental health needs are considered during this extended period of, of working differently and working from home very often working in isolation how has Dow Jones been approaching this uh, it, I mean, it is a, a, the core of, of, of this issue for a lot of people and uh, a lot of companies, should I say. And as I said at the beginning, our leadership put it front and center in terms of, you know, the health and well-being. Interestingly, when we started in, in Asia, just from a, you know, individual manager's point of view, it was about testing things as much as anything. It was, you know, what works, how do, pe how do we make sure people feel connected I mean, huge challenges, particularly in Asia. I mean, Hong Kong high rises are not the biggest apartments in the world. The schools were closed. Multi generational living in in some places. I mean, it was it was a tough environment to to, to work, homeschool your kids, you know, uh, look after your parents, whatever the case may have been. So, we we certainly would stay very close to managers. What what was the cadence of calls how how should we um how should we react how should we respond i think very quickly it came down to you know ensuring that we approach things with compassion sensitivity communication was was absolutely uh, clear uh, and needed to be clear then a week or two in um and we also surveyed our staff a lot and we got a lot of information the people team our hr team really you know stepped up um with, with education programs, policy changes, ways of uh, ensuring people have the time off to care for sick relevant, uh, relatives, take time out of the day as well. Um, so that was uh, key. Toby, who's been posting in this chat, just the, who runs comms for Asia, but the, the, the comms mechanism that we have globally, uh, mm. building a coronavirus site so our staff could get up-to-date information, uh, whether that was around travel restrictions uh, and the like, a dedicated email uh, address uh, so they could ask any questions that they had. We have an incredible real estate team, a security team, technology, um, uh, who, who obviously all had to fire on all cylinders to make sure that our staff were, were looked after, that we addressed any issues with working and, and ultimately obviously with, with health and well-being. Uh, it's it's a challenge, right? I mean, we've all done it. We've, this is certainly at 9 p.m. Well, now 10 p.m. on a on a Thursday evening here in Hong Kong. This is not my first video call today, and we find ourselves uh, in front of these computer screens, 
uh, we, we don't have commute. some of us are missing the commute time where we could uh, we could take some time off and you know it's 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 so important that that this is watched very very closely uh, there are there are a lot of I don't need to list all the resources that we've we've um, put in place for for our staff but there is a lot of them and, and driven by Camila our, our chief people officer but with her team around the world but you know I think people don't pay that the highest level of attention at, at, at their and their staff's risk because I think it is a is a genuine one and there will be some positives to come out of this but if we're not prepared if we don't uh, think and and treat our employees with compassion sensitivity listen uh, and um, give people safe environments to be able to talk and and raise concerns uh, then 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 I would imagine uh, that the trouble will be brewing but but I'm hopeful um, that looking at what people are saying, the one-on-ones I'm having, the team meetings I'm having, the survey results we're seeing, what other people are saying across the business. While we can't uh, deny it's a challenging work environment, I think it's one that the Dow Jones employees are, are stepping up to with the support of the executive team and, and all other teams here. Fantastic, it's, it's really good to hear, very positive uh, response. We're almost out of time. Um, Johnny, let me close before I wrap up. Let me just close by asking you to give me a prediction. Um, when do you think we might return to some kind of pre-crisis level of consumer and advertising spend? What's your kind of time horizon for that? Um, well, obviously, we're seeing increased spend already in some areas of our, our business, particularly around uh, subscription and, and, and memberships. Uh, I think that we will, uh, prediction, I can give a prediction, you probably won't, you're going to call me out on it. I know you are, uh, but, but I think uh, post summer uh, for, for our, our year is July, uh, so Q1 will end uh, at the end of September. And I, uh, I think we're already seeing conversations with very big customers here in Asia pick up quicker, uh, and I think Asia is a leading indicator for for. Uh, for some of these advertising clients. Of course, there are big conversations happening everywhere in the world, but I think in the US, people are opening up more to um, their activity. And I think we're probably looking at around September to October for um, some big campaigns to, to, be, to be landing. As soon as that? I mean, we, we've, we've heard people talk about the second half of next year. You well, think even, even this summer, we might see some green shoots? It's half full, James. This is half full. <laughs> Half full of uh, half full of water at this time of night, of course. Um, yeah, I genuinely do, and I and I say that just from personal experience and conversations I know we're having with some some. Uh, you know, I, th I think there will it will be a uh, there'll be obviously a tail to it, but I think that's when we'll start seeing this uh, uh, this level of appetite return that we're looking for. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much to my guests today, to, to Johnny, to Nick and to Joe. Thank you very much for joining me. It's been a really fascinating session. The hour has flown by and we've uh, covered a lot of ground. We didn't have time to answer everybody's questions, but uh, I think we've answered most of them. While I'm going to do my little outro, I'm going to just share the contact details for anybody who does want to get in touch with uh, Nick or Joe on the Commercial Partnerships team. You can see those on screen now to the uh, uh, all of those of you who's attended thank you very much indeed for attending this series of FIP insider webinars we are taking a short break next week and then we'll be back as i said earlier on june the 4th with the big issue uh, in the meantime you can follow us on twitter we're at fit world and i am at fit ceo you can also view the recording of this webinar and of all of our webinars on our youtube channel which is also fit world on youtube if you haven't already subscribed to the newsletter please do so on fit.com uh, and if you haven't donated to the GoFundMe page please do go and look at that and consider making a donation. Um, you will get a post event email tomorrow with details of the slides and how to sign up for future events and the newsletter and more. Keep an eye out for that but in the meantime have a very good rest of week and a good weekend. Thank you very much for joining and goodbye.